listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Wednesday, August 5th, and we get to talk hymns today, which is pretty awesome. (laughs) I'm super excited. These are really good hymns, too. Yes, yes. It's, you know, it's nice because we're in the green season. So uh, we get to, I mean, we could look at hymns all of the green season. We should just do that every week, shouldn't we? We should just like cover hymns every week during the green season. (laughs) I think we should. That's a really good idea. (laughs) (laughs) Why didn't I think of that sooner? Uh, Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Helping us uh, dig into these hymns today uh, is Benjamin Kologi. He's member of, uh, a member of Faith Lutheran Church in Plano, Texas, highly active church organist and composer and contributor to the Lutheran service book uh, Companion, and super excited to talk with him today. Benjamin, thanks for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit, I mean, we shared a brief bio there, but uh, tell us a little bit more about being a, a, a church organist and a composer, what got you interested in being an organist and a composer, a church musician? Well, I think it's really exciting when you can go to church and the gospel is proclaimed through the word, right? Um, through the readings and through the preaching, but it always struck me that the gospel is always also uh, proclaimed in the music. And the organ organists, the choir directors, the choir the instruments, they all had an integral part in proclaiming the gospel in, in a really interesting way, too. And I was early inspired um, by, by other organists I heard. I thought, well, I, I would really like to learn how to do this. And you know, I think there's a lesson to be learned there that it's really important to um, take your kids to church and have them hear, hear the great music of the church. You know, Lutherans have 500 years of great musical history. Um, Bach, we can claim the greatest composers in the world. I mean, how could you not be inspired (laughs) to be a church musician with a musician like Johann Sebastian Bach or Walter or or others? That's so true. There's so much, so much you can learn from all of this church music and, and all of these great hymns, which is why we love to talk about them on the coffee hour. And uh, let's dig into them so we don't run out of time because we, I think we run out of time pretty much every time we do this. So <laughs> uh, we designated two whole segments for it. Right? right. Maybe we won't run out of time this time. Uh, so we're looking at the uh, hymn of the day for the three year lectionary for the next three weeks. Hopefully we get through all three because uh, these are some good ones today. Uh, we have propers uh, 14, 15 and 16. So first we have uh, Lutheran service book 717, which I think is a fan favorite, probably for most everybody, especially those with uh, people who uh, family members or loved ones who are in the Navy. So this is uh, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. What, what can you tell us about uh, how this hymn connects into where we are in this season of the church year? Of course. And that takes us straight into the gospel text for Sunday, which is Matthew fourteen twenty two, And it's the familiar story in which Jesus walks on water. Um, but it's interesting because the Matthew notes that Jesus had left his disciples as he went to pray and they went ahead of him on the Sea of Galilee. Um, but this storm comes up, as storms have to tend to do on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> and um, Matthew interestingly tells us that it was the fourth watch of the night in which Jesus started to walk to them on the lake. So that's that would have been Roman time, like 3 to 6 a.m., something like that. So this was the depth of night and early, or early dawn, and there was a storm coming. <laughs> and you can imagine how the, the uh, surprised the disciples were by this. They were probably... I would think already kind of on edge because of the storm. Um, I was in the Holy Land a couple years ago, and one of the um, newer attractions, I say newer, <laughs> is the ancient <laughs> so-called, it's uh, called the Jesus Boat, and it was dug up in 1986, I think. It's on display now. Um, it's a really small apparatus. I mean, it's 20-something feet by 7 feet to imagine the disciples, of course, Jesus had Jesus or nor the disciples necessarily had any connection with this particular boat, but it's seen as you know representative of what they would have had. And you're just looking at it, being out on the water in this would have been really scary. <laughs> it, it brought home to me exactly how precarious this water travel could be back then. 
But anyways, you know, Jesus calls to them and says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And of course, you know, Peter in his way takes <laughs> is the first one to take Jesus up on the offer and kind of begins to sink. But I think it's interesting Then the next thing that Peter does is as he begins to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. And I, I'm thinking here, doesn't this remind you of what we say at the beginning of our divine services? You know, Lord, have mercy, Kyrie and liaison. It's not the exact Greek, but it's uh, similar. And this realization that we can't save ourselves, you know, but are totally at God's mercy. And of course, Jesus does reach out and saves him and asks why he doubted. Although, you know, Matthew doesn't really record Peter's response. And so the wind dies down and Matthew records that those on the boat worshiped Jesus by saying, truly, you are the son of God. Um, and to me, this is one of those instances in which I, I see this recognition of Jesus and it brings about an acknowledgement of submission to Christ. You know, you can think also of perhaps this foreshadows what the centurion says on Good Friday. So something like, surely this man was the son of God. But anyways, that kind of sets us up for this hymn, which is Eternal Father Strong to Save. And Sarah, you, you're exactly right. This is a really popular hymn. Um, in one of my ministries, I record a hymn of one hymn a day, and I post it on Facebook. And I did this in May around Memorial Day, and it's, it's, it's gotten one of, gotten of, of the of the hundred or so hymn recordings I've done, this has gotten like the third most views mm -hmm. and the most comments. You know, people really like this hymn, uh, regardless of the fact that it's a Navy hymn. And if you watch movies whatsoever, you know, every time some British or American Navy theme is involved, you'll, you'll probably <laughs> hear this hymn. Um, but if you look at 717, if you have your hymn in front of you, um, there's actually... Um, there's, there's two stanzas off to the side, asterisk stanzas two and three. So it's kind of important to note what we're talking about first. And uh, so this hymn text comes from William Whiting. Um, he was a 19th century choir master, British at Winchester College in England. Um, uh, he, but he wrote what is stanza one, the asterisk stanza two, the asterisk stanza three, and then back to stanza four. So that's kind of what I wanted to look at today, just to clarify what, what exactly we're, we're doing. Um, but even though uh, William Whiting was a musician, he wrote the text. He did not write the tune, which was composed by John Bacchus Dykes, um, later. But it's interesting he, that Whiting arranges this hymn um, by each person of the Trinity. So in stanza one, we recount how God the Father's arm hath bound the restless wave who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. And, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I'm struck by this refrain that happens for each stanza, this, oh, hear us when we cry to thee. And to me, this almost echoes Peter's cry of, Lord, save me. Um, his second stanza, so we're looking at the asterisk stanza, uh, probably best applies to the account of Jesus calming the storm, but it relates to this gospel as well. You know, o Christ, whose voice the waters heard, and hush their raging at thy word, who walkest on the foaming deep, and calm amid its rage, didst sleep. And then again, O hear us when we cry to thee, for those in peril on the sea. And then, of course, this third stanza, we, we're dealing now with the Holy Spirit, turning to the Holy Spirit. This the spirit who didst brood upon the chaos, dark and rude, and bid its angry tumult cease, and give for wild confusion peace. And this, to me, almost has connotations of the creation story from Genesis mm -hmm. 1, in which that spirit of God hover, hovered over the face of the waters. Um, and of course, the fourth stanza, you go back to the other side of the page, O Trinity of love and power, we pray that our people shield in danger's hour from rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoever they go. 
And that those are Whiting's original stanzas. The two that, the middle two stanzas that appear on um, the left side of the page come from a, a hymnal later in the 20th century and simply were meant to give other means of transportation for which we can pray. So um, land transportation and air and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think in terms of application of this hymn and looking at the news this summer, um, seems like we've been, our country has been filled with all manner of disruption and lack of peace. I mean, from fire, I think of that explosion yesterday in Beirut mm -hmm. and um, Beirut and the unrest even in America's cities this summer. And, you know, what, what better word to describe it than tempest? You know, we had a fairly significant hurricane here in Texas a couple of weeks ago, and I, mm -hmm. I think there's one on the East Coast right now. And uh, all of this, of course, in the midst of a pandemic, it's, it's, it's really ridiculous and sometimes seems more than we can handle. And, you know, I, I can't help but think perhaps Peter felt like this. You know, he was confident at first he can handle this. But when it became clear to him that he wasn't really in control, he was forced to rely on Christ for his strength and I think if we really pay attention to this hymn, it kind of tells us to do the same thing. You know, we acknowledge that we, we, you know, we experience this rage, this foaming deep, and we pray for Christ, for God to hear us when we cry to thee, you know. Hmm. Um, what a beautiful hymn. And, and you're right, so timely for mm -hmm. times when when things seem uncertain when uh especially the the elements when when it seems like uh the, the elements around us you know here talking about waves and rocks uh, and and the the things around us too the storms that we face right now as well mm -hmm. we have more hymns to talk about uh <laughs> i to, to dig into really i love digging into this one eternal father strong to save uh certainly on the top of uh, i'm sure many people's list we have more talks or more talks more hymns to talk about uh <laughs> with benjamin Kaloji here in just a moment on the coffee hour you're listening to coffee hour i'm Andy bates i'm sarah golseth Fifth, 2020 KFUO Radio thanks our day sponsors Marty and Deborah Abushan of St. Louis, Missouri. Marty and Deborah made a gift to KFUO Radio in thanksgiving to God for his many blessings and especially for his healing of their daughter, Kate. Thank you, Marty and Deborah Abushan, for helping us share the gospel and for being today's KFUO Day Sponsors. On this Wednesday, August 5th, 2020, KFUO Radio thanks our day sponsors, Marty and Deborah Abushan of St. Louis, Missouri. Marty and Deborah made a gift to KFUO Radio in thanksgiving to God for his many blessings and especially for his healing of their daughter, Kate. Thank you, Marty and Deborah Abushan, for helping us share the gospel and for being today's KFUO Day Sponsors. Wednesday on Issues Etc. We'll continue our series, The Words of Scripture, talking with Pastor Will Whedon about the word blessed in the Bible. It's media coverage of religion with Terry Mattingly, and we'll discuss anxiety and necessity with Pastor Roy Askins of the Lutheran Witness Magazine. Issues Etc. Live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. <laughs> Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We're talking hymns, hymns <laughs> of the green season, the, the, mm -hmm. the Pentecost hymnody. And today we're talking with Benjamin Kologi, a member of Faith Lutheran Church in Plano, Texas, a uh, church organist and composer, uh, all, all around just uh, great church musician, a contributor to the Lutheran Service Book Companion as well. So we, we've had a chance to dig into <laughs> uh, number 717 in Lutheran Service Book. Benjamin, anything else before that? I know we could go on probably for much longer about 717, but anything <laughs> that we didn't cover that you really want to cover before we go on to uh, proper 15 um, at LSB 615? No, let's move on. All right. So uh, take us into proper 15, uh, Lutheran Service Book number 615. Well, I, this proper, this is also from Matthew, and uh, 
I think it needs a, it's a little shorter and probably needs a little less explanation. So maybe we'll have more time <laughs> to go into the hymn. But this is from uh, Matthew fifteen twenty one, and it's the account of the Canaanite woman. And she was coming to Jesus and just imploring him to heal her daughter from a demon, which, of course, he does after the woman's imploration of, and she says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. And she repeats her cry, saying, Lord, help me. And, of course, you can see this connection back to the previous previous reading of what Peter says. Um, but both the Canaanite woman and Peter, they come to, G to Christ, out of their desperation. And, you know, they both realize they cannot help themselves. And I am thinking, too, doesn't this sound like our liturgy, which we begin most Sundays saying, Lord of mercy upon us, Kyrie eleison, <laughs> or even later on in the liturgy, uh, the Agnus Dei, uh, O Christ, thou Lamb of God, that takest away the sin of the world. What do we ask? Have mercy upon us. Um, but I also think it's important to note in both of these cases that uh, Jesus is identified very specifically. He's not a nebulous God out of someone's imaginative fiction. You know, he's the son of God, or in the case of the, the Canaanite woman, the Lord, son of David. And it's important perhaps to note the specificity of these scriptural texts. They proclaim exactly who Christ is. And really, this is what a good hymn text does, too. It doesn't talk nebulously about Christ or God. I mean, think about 717, God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. You know, that's very specific who God is. So good hymns identify Christ very specifically, too. And that takes us to this hymn appointed, which is When in the Hour of Utmost Need. And it's Lutheran Service Book 615. I, I think this might be kind of one of those underrated hymns. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's not one of those hymns that everybody says, oh, well, this is, this is my favorite, you know, this is my, <laughs> this is my mighty fortress. It's, but it's really quite a profound text. It was written by Paul Eber, E-B-E-R, and he was a student of Luther and Melanchthon at, in Wittenberg. <laughs> and um, ended up as a preacher at the Castle Church in Wittenberg, which, of course, is famous for its 95 theses. And uh, he was later a professor at the university and uh, also took over for, for Johannes Buchenhagen, who was Luther's pastor in uh, Wittenberg. But look at this hymn text, and you can really see, I think, the correlation with the Matthew Gospel. He says, when in the hour of, uh, of deepest need, we know not where to look for aid, when days and nights of anxious thought no help or counsel yet have brought, then is our comfort this alone that we may meet before thy throne. To you, O faithful God, we cry for rescue in our misery. Uh, looking back at Matthew's text, Matthew doesn't tell us a lot about the Canaanite woman's daughter's problems, but uh, we can imagine that this hymn stanza is probably indicative of her, you know, her anguish, her inner turmoil at this time, for which she really implored rescue from Jesus. And uh, Jesus rescued Peter, he rescued the Canaanite woman, and he promises the same for us. Now, as I was looking at this hymn last night, I was looking in my very handy Lutheran service book hymnal companion, which I commend to everyone. Uh, my friend Joe Hurl, who's, who, who edited that, he's at Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska. I'm sure he would want the plug. And this is really a wonderful, wonderful resource. The best hymnal companion that, uh, uh, of, of any denomination for probably 100 years. But, you know, it's two volumes. It's not for the faint of heart, but <laughs> it, it is written so that people can really understand. You, you don't need to be a scholar or a pastor to understand. So I just say all that. I just preface all that. Say I was reading my hymnal companion last night about this hymn, and I, I learned something I didn't know. Um, uh, the hymnal companion tells us that on an early manuscript of this hymn is found the inscription, and I quote, Paul Aber wrote this hymn in the year 1566 when the Turks raged in Hungary and there was pestilence in our region, unquote. 
<laughs> now, in the last six months or so, I've been reading and writing and recording a lot of music and hymns, and I have been really surprised how many hymns were written during a time of plague. Um, this, this is something that people have dealt with for centuries. And I, I guess from a practical perspective, it's really comforting to know that we're not the only ones who have experienced this, uh, this pandemic or whatnot. But are, you know, these people's faith in Christ sustained them through those times, and uh, Christ will sustain us. Um, so I'm always glad to find such hymns and to share them with others. And I didn't actually know that this was a hymn written during plague time, too. But it, it's fascinating. <laughs> and so in Paul Aber's words, we continue by imploring, quote, For you have promised, Lord, to heed your children's cries in time of need. Through him whose name alone is great, our Savior and our Advocate. And again, you know, we come to God the Father through Christ's name. It's a very specific name um, through which we go to God the Father. And then maybe to kind of conclude this hymn, uh, this, this hymn is one of the Cairn leader. A Cairn lead means it's a core hymn of the Reformation. Uh, a, a core hymn was written by Luther or his students or his close contemporaries of the 16th century. And all of these Karen leader, we call them, the core songs, they represent this doctrine that, this Lutheran doctrine, very particularly. Um, you know, after all, this was a time in which the Lutheran church was trying to define who it was exactly, uh, set, it side, set itself apart from the Roman church. And one of the ways in which it did this was through hymnody. So that's one reason why this hymn um, is, is included in this hymnal and has been for hundreds of years. It's an important hymn to our faith. It is so many, so many tidbits of information, and I second your uh, appeal to everyone to uh, get your hymnal companion. It is probably the best purchase you'll ever make in, for your music theology library. We have uh, just about three-ish minutes left, so we're going to have to run through this last one, um, which is unfortunate because I think it's a, it's also a favorite for a lot of people. <laughs> uh, Lutheran Service Book Six Forty Five, built on the rock. What is your, uh, what is your three-minute elevator? Uh, insight into this hymn and it's, it's so, a good one. So just, it's based on Matthew 16 and basically Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter is the first to answer. He says, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replies, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, this hymn 645, Built on the Rock, really, this, this was written by Danish hymn writer Nikolai Grundtvig. It's much better known in the Danish or uh, Scandinavian Lutheran churches than in German Lutherans, although, you know, the German Lutherans sing it just as much as anybody else. But he <laughs> also wrote the hymn God's Word is Our Great Heritage, also in hmm. LSB. He intended that as a fifth stanza to Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress. I'm not sure that was such a good idea, but it's a great standalone <laughs> hymn, great standalone hymn by itself. Um, Grindvig was a complex theologian, but he was generally orthodox, and he resisted the uh, rationalist tendencies of the time, which sought to turn the Bible into a book of moralisms. He was really interested in preserving the Apostles' Creed. He had some really weird ideas about the Creed, but he thought that... that that the, the creed was important, and I think this kind of goes back to the Matthew, you know, who do you say I am? Who, who is Christ? Um, and just looking at this hymn, you know, I was reading recently about the persecution of churches in China and Christians and the destruction of churches, and this first stanza, this immediately comes to mind. Built on the rock, the church doth stand, even when steeples are falling, crumbled have spires in every land, Bells still are chiming and calling, calling the young and old to rest, but above all the souls distressed, longing for rest everlasting. So, you know, amongst all the decay and discord of the world, particularly in this summer, you know, this, we were bombarded with images of falling steeples. I don't know if they're not metaphorical or literal, both, but they've always been a problem. So, you know, Grentvig's words assure us that surely in temples with Made with hands, God the Most High is not dwelling. High above his 
High above earth his temple stands, all earthly temples excelling. And you can also see his concern for the sacraments. He brings a sacramental theology in here. Look at stanza four. Here stands the font before our eyes, telling how God has received us. The altar recalls Christ's sacrifice and what his supper here gives us. And so then this interestingly links to the scriptures. Here sound the scriptures that proclaim Christ yesterday, today the same, and evermore our Redeemer. And just to conclude, Grundtvig really was important for Scandinavian Lutherans. And if you go to Copenhagen today, you might encounter the, uh, the uh, Grundtvigskirche, the Grundtvigs church, which was built in the 30s and 40s. And it's, in, in a way, it's quite a hideous monstrosity of modern <laughs> architecture. But it also, it also the, the front facade looks like a pipe organ. And it's kind of a, a, a tribute to the hymnody of Grundtvig. Hymns, history, trivia, That's all so good great. stuff. Benjamin, so thank you so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour today. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm Eddie Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.